Dogs in, wits out. Scotch proverb. I'm Doug Selby, District Attorney of Madison County. Hi, Frank Antrim. And that young lady sitting there is Janie. She's my son's widow. And seated beside her, it was my delight to discover this evening, is her mother, Mrs. Doris Kane. And that gentleman up there is uh, Alex, what's his name? Uh, Cordova. I drive the cab up front. And the man in the pool? Total, complete, and unequivocal stranger. How'd he get there? Who found him? I guess everybody, right? It's the truth, Your Worship. Well, let's begin at the beginning. You picked up Mrs. Kane where? I picked her up at the airport. Time? Uh, ten past nine. Uh, got her here about half past. What plane did you travel on, Mrs. Kane? Uh, the six o'clock flight from Denver. I've come to visit my daughter. Why didn't you call from the airport? Well, I, um, I didn't have her phone number. It's unlisted. Unlisted? Well, I, uh, I... I haven't seen my daughter in over three years. Uh, there was... Well, it's a family matter. Mrs. Kane and her husband never did approve of my son. They never met Brian, but they wouldn't let a little thing like that interfere with their disapproval. Yes, we'd heard quite enough about him to... Mother, we aren't answering Mr. Selby's questions. My husband was killed last year in an automobile accident. My father died several months ago. Mother wrote to me and I wrote back asking her to visit. And you arrived at uh, 9.30, you said? Right. The lady rang the bell. No one answered. No one answered? Well, you see, my quarters are downstairs. Now, Janie was with me, helped me do my exercises. And I do, you know. And of course, Donna, you couldn't hear one thing from the other. Nobody met you at the airport and nobody's home. Uh, you're sure you're visiting the right daughter, lady? Jane is the only one I have. Her letter said... I don't understand. Uh, let's drive down and find a phone, huh? I... I can't just leave. Uh, look, lady. But, no, a shot from a gun. That would raise the devil in hell, wouldn't it? We heard a shot, and then went and found it. Jane. What is it, Janie? What's the matter? Let there be light. And so it was. Then we telephoned, Sheriff, and we waited for you. And you left things as they were? Oh, exactly. The body in the pool and the gun on the deck. Gun? What gun? Evening, Doug. What have you got for me? Rex is out at the pool, Harry. He'll show you. Good. Selby! How come the sheriff's here, but the city police have to pick it off a radio call? These folks phoned Rex's office. You were notified as soon as we verified the debt. I wouldn't like to think you're trying to make me look incompetent. Just because we were on different sides in the election last year. Not sir. now. This is Otto Larkin, chief of police from Madison City. Together, we'll want to take statements from you all. Otto, there seems to be a gun missing. Oh, no, now. It's right out there by the edge of the pool. You can't miss that. It isn't there. But it's on the decking. All right. We'll find it for you. Charlie? Charlie, tell Bob Terry to come in, please. Okay, Mr. Selby. This gun, uh, did all of you see it? And no one touched it? No, I mean, uh, we all had eyes for the guy in the pool. Too neat to pack carelessly. Who put this in the suitcase? Bob? Mr. Selby. 
plastic bag. Tell Otto he can stop looking for the gun and go over the house. Yes, sir. You don't mind if we take your fingerprints, if only to clear you should we find any on the gun. Oh, but they do mind. Unless you have a specific person in mind and evidence and would care to make a charge. Thanks for coming. Mr. Selby, this is our attorney, Mr. A.B. Carr. I believe you've heard of him? Yes, I have. Do you represent the entire family? Oh, yes. And none of them has anything further to say to you this evening. Unless, of course, they're general statements or possibly evidentiary. But uh, personalized statements in answer to questions that may indicate suspicion. No. I think you'll understand my position, Counselor. Now, this is a clear print of a right thumb that I found on a cartridge case in the cylinder of the gun. It was probably left by whoever loaded the gun. Does it match any print on those glasses we borrowed from the Antrim home last night? No. I sent the thumbprint into L.A. along with the serial number on the gun. If they have nothing, they'll check the FBI for us. Any line on the victim's ID? Nothing. We're checking, but he's John Doe for now. Yeah. He's right here. Harry Marshall. Morning, Harry. What do you got? Two bullets. Both smack center in the heart. Or either one of them could have done the dirty work. Different calibers, two guns. That's Bob Terry's department. I'm not finished here. What time did he die? Despite the legends, an autopsy won't give you any better than a few hours' guess. All I can tell you is that he was already dead when he went into the pool. No water in the lungs. Which bullet killed him? The one that went in first. Harry, which one went in first? I can't tell you. Only that the second bullet was fired so close and aimed so carefully that it ended the same wound made by the first one. But the angle was slightly off, so we have two wound tracks. Not that that helps your problem. It sure doesn't. Any murder weapon I bring into court now would be discredited by a defense attorney. Unless I can prove which bullet was fired first. mail on your desk. And uh, Mr. Poland here has been waiting since I opened the office. Jeffrey Poland, how do you do? Better and better, thank you. Murder in pool. A known victim shot at Antrim Hall. Can we talk about it? Yeah. Yeah, come on in. Says here you're a private detective. A state license. Came up from L.A. a couple of days ago. Bad, bad scene. You came here to talk? Talk. An insurance investigation report is sitting in my hotel room. I sign it and Jane Antrim collects $500,000. That's a lot of money. Even today. Even for an insurance company. But you're not an insurance detective. Work some insurance wheels. Know things, hear things, got a few contacts. But sometimes I'm brought in on the rough ones. Like the death of Jane Antrim's husband? The policy was on his life. Brian Antrim. I got the company to stall the payoff. Why? 10% of the face value, if the claim don't go through. Well, Mrs. Antrim calls in a lawyer. A.B. Cobb. He backs a lot of reputation. I've met him. He threatened suit? With interest if we don't pay up. Now, let's kill. Don't know that there's a connection, but... Are you here to give or to get? Quid pro quo. You know about these people up on that hill? No, but I'd like to. The girl married Brian Andrew. A charmer, but no good. Profession gambler. And doing fine. So they're married a while. Things start breaking bad. He loses heavy. He and a little lady start to fight a lot. His old man drops into L.A. and moves in with him. All this in one year? 
Right. So one night, the three of them go to dinner at the beach. The men drink too much. She and Brian start to fight about who drives. He drives off with his old man, leaves her in the parking lot. Coming through Topanga Canyon, the car goes over the edge. Frank gets thrown out, but Brian, uh-uh. He die on the scene or at the hospital? In the canyon. A fancy private sanitarium nearby, a place called a sanctuary, gets the call, sends an ambulance to bring him in. Real zip. Got Frank treatment in time to save his life. Saved his life, but he was left crippled. He's dead. Will never walk again. Also did something in his head. Traumatic amnesia. Can't remember that night. It's convenient, huh? It happens. Still, it's convenient. With the car busting apart in the fall and then burning up. We can't prove a thing. But this nose, it smells something. No skid marks. How drunk is a guy? He don't even try to stop him going over. I find reasons not to sign a report. Such as? Like a beneficiary can't collect if they deliberately cause the death. There's a word for that. You can prove it. They call it murder. Posters. I voted for you, you know. Thank you. May I come in? Of course. Uh, Mr. Frank's downstairs in his room with Mrs. Antrim's mother and that lawyer. Thank you. Uh, were you off last night, Miss... Uh... Ellen. Ellen Sachs. Oh, Lordy, I'm off every night. I don't live in, Mr. Selby. I just come in to clean three times a week. Well, the house is this big, you must have your hands full. Oh, that's a fact. Take a body and a half full time to do all this right. But that Mrs. Antrim, she don't want even half a body around. Secrets. Well, most people do like their privacy. Sure. Mrs. Antrim wants things kept private all right. The way she keeps Mr. Frank downstairs, like it was a dungeon. Why would she do that? Between you and me and the fence post are things she doesn't want Mr. Frank talking about. Things he might remember. And if he starts to, oh, Lordy, I'm afraid for him. Hey! Who is that phantom lover you're talking to, Eleanor? It's me again, Mr. Antrim. Doug Selby, may I come down? You can tear yourself away from that beauty. You're a better man than I am. Thanks, Owen. Well, in the bright light of day, Cheerier welcome I can give you than you found last night, Selby. Good. I'm glad you're here, Mr. Carr. There's some questions I'd like to ask Mrs. Kane. Well, incidentally, Mrs. Kane and I were just on our way to see you. I wonder if we had the same thing in mind. Well, I'm sorry. I, uh, I did something foolish last night. Unintentionally. The district attorney will understand. The gun, I... Uh, I picked it up. Well, I, uh, I was afraid to have it lying there untended. Uh, Mrs. Kane worried, and rightly, that the killer might return and use it again. Tell him what you thought. Well, I, uh, I was afraid that you might misunderstand, so I wanted Mr. Carr to return the gun and explain. But you, sir, were too astute to have discovered it yourself. There, no, no one's the worse for it. You understand the gravity of tampering with a murder weapon? Was it a murder weapon? You can't be sure. What's the charge for firing a bullet into a dead man, Mr. Selby? A felony, tampering with evidence of murder, aiding and abetting. You're not a man to trade small jokes. It's not about murder, no. Mrs. Kane, were you afraid the gun might implicate your daughter? Now, that question, Counselor, indicates that you've now ceased a general investigation and are aiming specific questions at a specific suspect. I shall therefore advise Mrs. Kane not to answer. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Cut and the thrust of flashes steel in the words. 
Tell me, have either of you drawn blood yet? There'll be no blood unless we uncap our foils in the courtroom, eh? If it comes to that. I understand you have trouble remembering things since your accident. Well, it's only about that night. There's nothing I remember of that. About all I know of it today is that my son Brian is no more, and that I got wheels for legs. We'll soon have the insurance. That'll be some compensation. Do you think so now? And how much for a man like Brian? They tell me I've got wit, but I'm just a ghost to him. Why, that man would walk into the room and the light would... It sprayed out before him. Women took him for a darling and men for a man. Oh, he was flawed. But then that just made him more of a human being, didn't it? Of all the people in the world that I've known, I love Brian best. I'm sorry. Was he your only child? There was none other. But then I'm spreading the pall over our... Uh, and Brian would be the last for that. I'm leaving, and you must have other business, shall we? If anything occurs to you, Miss Kane, will you please call me? I'm sorry I made your job harder. I, uh... Well, thank you. All right, let's climb up out of the pit. I'll race you to the top of the mountain. This is A.B. Carr. I don't think you two have met. Miss Martin is a reporter for the Madison Times. Charming. Mr. Carr, wouldn't you like to talk your clients into a first-class interview with the press? But, my dear, that would be too dull, even for Sleepy Little Madison. Well, perhaps you tell us what made you decide to move to Sleepy Little Madison. Well, we all need a quiet place after the Daily Wars, and Madison is so close to Los Angeles that they'll grow together anyway. <laughs> You mean that Los Angeles, the monster that's going to swallow the world? Well, it will be one city, Los Angeles to San Diego. Ask Selby. The administration his group replaced represented the early reaching tentacles of megalopolis. Well, we did beat them. Yes, but for how long? And do you really want to stop the advance of the 20th century? Do I have to take it all? Or can I take the best parts of it? Blend it with the best parts of the old? Oh, it's a package deal. Bad comes with the good. People live better and longer these days. A little pollution isn't too high a price to pay for that. A little pollution? All you take out of life are its values, leaving nothing but corruption, no thanks. The quality of my life is at least as important as its length. I apologize for patronizing you to this moment. Miss Martin. trouble. Car, I mean. I suppose I should play coy and say, what else could you mean? Matter of fact, I just came from your house. Now, could be blocked fuel line or the carburetor.
Did you find what you wanted at my house? Your mother, with your lawyer at her side, gave me an explanation as to why she hid the gun in her suitcase. I know you have to do these things, but please be gentle with mother. She's not really used to dealing with the uglier facts of life. Keep that in mind. Dad gone, she's alone. Oh my. You have Frank. He's a lively character. As you say, I have, I have Frank. Any sign of him remembering the night of the accident? No. You having any luck? I have to go. In a minute. And I think there is something to heredity. Frank is a... He's a great character. I imagine your husband might have been cut of the same cloth. Oh, yes. Brian was that. I remember when I first met him. He reminded me of a poem I'd learned in high school. The wind was a torrent of darkness among the gusty trees. The moon was a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas. The road was a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, and the highwayman came riding, riding, riding. The highwayman came riding up to the old inn door. Try and start the car. Drop this thing off in the garage and have that carburetor clean. Oh, well, that'll have to be next week. I really... Who's that? What? Oh, nothing. I have to go. Thank you. They've got to fix it on John Doe. Good. Tell him I'd like to see that stuff when he gets in, would you? Oh, Doug, those two bullets that were in the body? One's a Peters, 9 millimeter. The other's a Winchester, 38. It was fired from the 38 Colt Police Special that you found. You couldn't by any chance tell me which one went in first, could you? I might, with a little more magnification. Then magnify. You fix the murder bullet, I'll buy you the best dinner in Madison. Give me a little incentive. Make that in L.A. Like I said. I'll buy you the best dinner in L.A. You still here? Where would I go? Do yourself any good with that stuff I gave you? What you gave me were suspicions. Nobody ever confessed on just talk. You got anything I need? Just some letters for your signature. I'll put them on your desk. Thanks. Here. Why don't you go home? If anything comes up in your line, I'll call you. Got nothing else to do. So maybe sign a report and give away half a million dollars. My client makes money if I just sit here and do nothing. You know, the way you've been acting, you'd think it was your half a million. Here's a package from L.A., Doug. And here's a wanted poster they were just putting out on our John Doe. Martin Rome. Yeah. Rome and the Confederate were convicted of criminal extortion last week. They beat up the guard who was moving them to Chino and took off with his gun. 
Serial number on the guard's gun matches the one we found at the Antrim home last night. There's more. The thumbprint on this fella, Rome's accomplice, matches the one Bob found on the cartridge case. T. Cardiff. Rex, this guy was standing outside this building not ten minutes ago. I'll get out an APB fast. Hold it! Quid pro quo, fellas. I told you about that sanitarium. The sanctuary that picked up Frank and Brian's remains? Yes, yeah, so? The ambulance attendant was named Morton Rome. And the driver? Pete Cardiff. Now, what was that you said this morning about convenient? patients are people in the public eye. They have personal, medical, and psychological problems. They must have their privacy. Dr. Garnett, an informal talk is the best way to ensure that. Why did you fire Morton Rome? He was convicted of extortion. Did that tie into the sanctuary? I can't look it up. He, along with his buddy, one Pete Cardiff, he overheard a patient rambling under anesthetic. It had nothing to do with your case. Well, then tell me about the Antrims. Which one? Brian? Nothing we could do for him. Frank, we saved his life. And that's absolutely all I have to say to you. Well, what were the extent of his injuries? Would you like it better if I subpoenaed your records? Records. Antrim, Frank. The sanctuary is the most modern private hospital on the West Coast. We're completely computerized and microfilm. A flick of the red switch, a specific request, and in a moment or two, voila. A complete medical history of one Frank Antrim. If you don't mind, I'll translate into layman's terms. The patient was admitted in a comatose state there was injury to brain, nerve, and spine. We instituted emergency treatment. You called the family first. Of course. As I recall, Mrs. Antrim had some sort of trouble getting home from a restaurant. How did she respond to the news of the death of her husband? Well, she was devastated, of course, but brave. She was concerned for her father-in-law. He couldn't be moved, so she suggested that we put him up here in our best suite. There are a number of operations. How long did he stay here? For more than three months. And then she took him home. Yes? They're waiting surgery for you, doctor. Thank you. I'll be right there. Uh, about his memory loss, will he remember? Why, we can't predict about a thing like that. Traumatic amnesia after an experience of that kind is quite common. By the way, who notified your hospital of the accident? I beg your pardon? How did you know to send an ambulance? That was a phone call. Yes, that was it, of course. Well, who called? It was an anonymous caller. People just don't want to become involved. They'll call for help and then just fade away. And you'll have to excuse me. But why in this case? There wasn't a fight. A car went off the road. Why not give your name? I'm sure I don't know. If you'll excuse me, they're waiting for me in surgery. I hope it's been helpful. It's been enlightening. Thank you, Dr. Garnett. Good luck in your search. I'll be in surgery, Miss Harris. Dr. Garnett's office. 
No, I think it was born yesterday. Patient registry, January 12th, 1969. Well, I suggest... Uh, Antrim. Rona Corbin. Ah! Ah! Say that. And that's a print. Very good, Rona. Bring your playmate with you while we get our next setup. Jack, I want a tight head on Rona. And let's put down some tracks and dolly along the bank. <sighs> Aren't you a dear to wait for me? And speaking of weights, <laughs> curse the sadist who discovered that figure control comes from attaching tons to one's body. <sighs> uh, let's see. Uh, thank you, darling. Uh, who are you interviewing for? Was it uh, AP? Uh, no, as I told you, Miss Corbin, I'm the district attorney of Madison County. Oh, yes, of course. Are you enjoying your stay in Hollywood, Mr. Uh, Sweetie? Uh, Selby's the name. About your stay at the sanctuary. Oh, no, 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 naughty, naughty, naughty. That's no mental insult. Rona's little hang-up, not for publication. Gentlemen's agreement. How do they treat your hang-up for the sanctuary? Don't be silly now. Honestly, Rona does not have a drinking problem. People just like to talk. Gossip, gossip, gossip. Well, let's not talk about Rona then. Oh, but I'm fascinating, really. You are that, Miss Corbin. But there's a man named Antrim. What's that fink got to do with anything? Good question. I don't know anything about the lousy crook. It's been years since I've even seen dear old Bry, really. Right. Brian! Oh, where did you last see him? Oh, it was ever so long ago. You heard about his death? Long past due, sonny boy. Tragic, though. Any man's death diminishes me because I'm involved in mankind. You know where I got that? John Dunn. And you said it in one of your pictures. What do you make of the talk about his accident not being an accident? Who said that? Do you know anybody would want to kill him? I'd heard he owed money to the mob. He might have been so terrified of them, he killed himself. No, suicide's a pretty drastic way to avoid being killed. Well, how about they killed him? I mean, he wouldn't pay his debts, so the mob took care of him. From the picture of the same name, no again. Tough as it was to collect from Brian alive, it was impossible to collect from him dead. You got any other notions? Yeah, Buster Brown. You would better go home now. Oh, I'm sorry if I upset you. It's Frank Antrim I want to talk about. Who is Frank Antrim? Brian's father. He was treated at the sanctuary. He had suite 220, January 12th. The guy next door? That was Brian's father? Well, didn't you talk to him? The sanctuary, you don't talk to anyone. You do your thing and you go home. I was three weeks that time getting a... resting. Nerves. Go bother whoever moved in after I left. It's that early period that interests me. Tough. Look, I don't know the Andrums, except Brian, and he was trouble. The only handy thing he ever brought me was Garnett in the sanctuary. The rest was a bad scene, and I kicked it. How did he bring you Garnett? All right, everybody, fun time. Everyone back into the pool. I have to go now. You have been sweet. May I have your robe, darling? Thank you, darling. And you must come again, soldier. In the meantime, <laughs> keep a lovely thought. Verona.
Doug, they're setting you up for a kill. Read the Sentinel. Chief Otto Larkin aids in your search for the murderer. And if nothing turns up, you're the goat. You know, the guy who invents a handle for these things is going to wind up a millionaire. The Sentinel is trying to make a political issue out of this murder. Sylvia, how'd you like to do something constructive for me? If this meal is a bribe, the least you can do is feed me off china plates with silverware that doesn't fit. There is some information that an enterprising reporter could dig out of her newspaper's board. Could she now? About Rona Corbin. The movie star? I want to find out about her spending time at the sanctuary. Also, anything connecting her to Brian Andrews. Now, that could be a story. Look, I've got to get back. You enjoy your lunch. Oh, darn it. You'd better get over to the police station, Mr. Selby. Captain Larkin has a prisoner. He's posing for pictures for the Sentinel to show how he caught the man you're looking for. Don't forget to send me prints of all of those. Hi, Selby. Just about to phone you. Sure you were, as soon as he ran out of film. Congratulations, Otto. Did he resist? I wish he had. Mr. Cardiff, has Chief Larkin informed you of your right to remain silent and to retain counsel? Oh, you don't have to tell that one about counsel. He's all fixed. What do you mean? Tell the district attorney where I grabbed you. Like the man said, I don't have to say nothing. So you tell. I busted into the home of that lawyer, A.B. Carr, and pulled this one out from under a bed. But Otto, you should have gotten a warrant. I didn't want to chance him getting away. All right, let's go over it again. How? Well, Charlie was cruising the back lanes when he sees this joker sunning himself in the yard. This guy ducks into the house when he spots the police car. Otto. Even you ought to know, you can't bust into a man's home without a warrant. Car must be in L.A. on business, and we haven't got much time, fellas. There isn't much we can do now. Doug, you're a bright boy. Put your mind to it. All right, all right. If I made a mistake, it was in trying to do my duty. We're all in this together, on the same side. Come on, buddy, come up with something. Go. Doug, we found it. Those are prints, Bob? Loud and clear. There's three days' worth of newspapers over there. Hmm? There's three days since the night of the murder. Yeah. And that creep lawyer has been hiding him out on us. Your head should go nicely beside that of the boar. May I have it now, Counselor? Search warrant signed by Judge Faraday. You can go ahead with your work, Rex. On what grounds did this judge of yours issue this warrant? He's not mine. As for grounds, today's your housekeeper's day off. I questioned her at home. She volunteered a signed statement that a man's been living here. She also identified Carter's wanted poster. And she gave me her keys to your home. Well, I'm sure the poor ignorant woman said a number of things, none of much legal worth. Not enough for a warrant. So I see. Well, I've been saying in my apartment in Los Angeles. I, uh, I know nothing of what you think you're finding here. Evidence that a wanted man has been living in this room for three days? Unless you want to claim this as your normal reading matter. Well, we all have our little hang-ups. By the way, did you find anyone here? Yes, Cardiff. Before or after you secured this warrant? You represent Cardiff? 
But before we talk about that, what do you intend to do with whatever it is you might find here? There's a question of harboring a wanted criminal. As you say, a question. But there's also a question of entering my home without a warrant. Also a question. What do you suggest? What you intended, I suggest, when you secured this warrant. If either of us presses his point, it might prove embarrassing and inconclusive. So shall we drop all the technicalities and address ourselves to the fact that you have a prisoner in custody? That might save the taxpayers. All right. I represent Cardiff. I want him returned to Los Angeles immediately so I can start his appeals. And I propose he be held in connection with the murder of Morton Rome. In that case, I want him charged or I'll secure a writ of habeas corpus for his release. I'll secure a complaint this afternoon charging him with murder. And we'll immediately arraign and set a date for a preliminary hearing. Naturally. Now, if you'll all clear out, I'll lock my house and visit my clients. Okay. All right, boys, let's go home. We saved all those bacon, now our fat's in the fire. There's no sign of a missing gun here. We need it if we're gonna hold on to Cardiff. Doug, this Cardiff, he's nothing but a small time punk. Where does he get cash to buy a lawyer like Carr? That's a big question, isn't it? No, no. Keep them. I wouldn't want your trip to have been for nothing, Counselor. It wasn't. So I broke into his house and hid out, waiting for Mr. Carr to come home. I wanted him to handle my appeal. I didn't have Mr. Carr's knowledge or his... his... Uh... Here's the word you want, consent. That's the word, consent. So you came to Madison only to find Mr. Carr. So help me God. Not to look up any member of the Antrim family. The what family? I see. You don't even remember a wrecked auto in Topanga Canyon? One man dead, the other badly injured? About a year ago. That one? Sure, it was some... Hey, Antrim. Don't tell me that family lives in this town. Hey, how's that for coincidence? <laughs> yes, how is it? Reasonable. What about your partner, Morton Rome? That's a crime what happened to Mort. Why don't you get the guy who hit him? I'm working on it. You don't know anything about it, right? On a button. What about the gun that was found at the pool with your fingerprints in the cartridge case? Sure, I checked the load once, but Mort carried the gun all the time. You never fired it. At what? Unless you can prove that the gun you hold is the murder weapon, I advise my client to travel no further on this uh, fishing expedition with you. Yeah. Send me back to L.A. so they can put me in jail to protect society. I'd like a few minutes with Mr. Cardiff now, if you don't mind. We're through. Guard. I'll be helping you. You think you'll have enough time to prepare for the hearing? Three days? More than enough to assemble evidence of probable cause. Well, we shall see, Counselor. Good night. Good night. Well, of course, we'll be at the hearing. I wouldn't miss that for the world. And you can't add anything to what you've already told us. Well, I like to tell a tale. A small bit of encouragement. Thanks. The truth is all we want. It's not enough that my legs is crippled. But you'd bend back my tongue as well, would you? Oh, here comes me, Eleanor, my cupbearer. Your cupbearer's only going to bear you one cup today. You've got to cut down on the caffeine. Quite right. I'll take whiskey. Oh, <laughs> no such thing. You want it on the phone, Mr. Selby? Are you? Excuse me, Frank. Right oh. Where's the phone? There isn't a call. I simply had to tell you I'm scared for him, and that's the truth. What? Well, what happened? He's remembering. He was talking to Mrs. Antrim's mother yesterday, and he started to tell her about a wild ride he had. I know he was talking about the accident. How much did he say? That's just it. 
He stops because she comes in, looking like the fury. But he's remembering, and she'll do something terrible to him for that. Maybe her and her mother together. Thanks, Ellen. You keep your eyes and ears open. Let me know if you hear anything more. It'll be too late then. How are you going, Doug? Is it duty calling your way? As long as you didn't see Cardiff here, you're of no use to me. Well, with a wee bit of a nudge, I could see even the fairies in the garden. We'll have to do without. <laughs> By the way, can you remember anything more about your accident? Now, what's that all about? I still have to find out why Cardiff and Rome came here. If I could remember, I'd keep it to myself. For if there's any fault to lay in the death of my Brian, I settle that up myself. That's the job of the law, Frank. The law? <laughs> it has no zest to it. Do you know, Doug, when I was a young man, I ran away from Brian's mother. I left her to take care of the boy alone. I thought you were close to your son. I was a stranger to him. I beat about the world hanging on to it with these fingernails of mine. But. When I come back at derelict and a wreck, Brian, he just took me in and he gave to me life. Because without him, Frank Andrew would be dead. So you see, when I tell you that there's nothing in the world I wouldn't do for Brian, I tell you no lie. Ah, but the secret is out. For I have been carried away in the walls heavier. You've been talking too much, Frank. You'll tie yourself. Oh, that's most unlikely. I'm on to my favorite subject. So I heard. When he has so little company, he will ramble when he's got an audience. Well, now, what is it you're afraid I might say, sweet Jamie? I'm leaving anyway. You'd like to walk me to my car? Thanks for trying, Frank. Twas my enormous delight, my boy. Jane, you realize you'll have to take the stand at the hearing. I got the subpoena. You know, you're in the poem, too. A redcoat troop came marching, marching, marching. King George's men came marching up to the old inn door. So that's it. I'm the king's man after your precious highwayman. Well, I'm afraid my tailor's fresh out of redcoats. I'm sorry, Doug. It isn't you. It's. I just wish it were over. The insurance claim paid, and I could go away from here. There's danger. Danger? I only meant that Frank would be better if I could take him away from here. How better? I hate it. The money running out, the suspicions, the dirty, grubby hands pouring on our lives. If I could only wash it all away, go back and start over. No one can. If you'd like to talk, I'd like to help you as far as my job will let me. And for something else, I'd like to help. As a friend. As a friend. I, I didn't know. Jenny, I simply can't talk to this housekeeper. I'll, I'll be right there, Mother. Thanks, dear. I'll keep it in mind. People, Mr. Selby. Ready, Your Honor. Mr. Corn. Quite ready, Your Honor. Call your first witness, Mr. Selby. Bang! There's a shot. You heard only one shot? Right. So we go, the lady and me, and look. A fellow's in the pool, and he's dead. But you didn't see the shooting. 
No, I did not. We heard the shot, and Janie ran up the stairs. But it took me a bit longer, as you might imagine. Did you see him fall into the pool? No, it... He was already there when I came out. All right. Well, then, would you please examine this and tell us if it looks like the weapon that you found at the pool? Yes, I picked this up and put it in my suitcase to save it for the police. Then you believe a bullet from this gun killed Morton Rome? Could be, but there were the two bullets. In my opinion, one of them was the cause of death. Thank you. That's all, Your Honor. Mr. Carr. Dr. Marshall, could you say which bullet killed Rome? I could not. Thank you. Call Robert Terry, please. This is a Peters 9mm soft nose bullet. It was fired into the body of Morton Rome from an unknown weapon. This is a Winchester 38 caliber soft nose bullet, and it was fired into the victim from this 38 caliber Colt to a special. Which bullet entered the body first? Objection. Speculative. If Your Honor will allow, Deputy Terry will demonstrate clearly a scientific basis for his response. Well, now the court must confess to a certain amount of curiosity. Go ahead, Bob. Let's see what you have. Answer the question. This is the bullet that entered first. Now, how do you know that? This is a blow-up of the nose of the Winchester bullet. You see these markings? Well, that's the material weave pattern. Now, this is a magnified piece of material from Rome's shirt. The weave pattern is similar to the pattern on the bullet. Uh, how did the marks get on the bullet? Well, the first bullet entered tearing an opening in the cloth. The soft lead traveling at high velocity was marked by the threads as it passed through. The second bullet, coming through the hole in the cloth, which had already been made by the Winchester, picked up no marking. The Peters bullet, this clean one, was obviously fired later in an attempt to confuse the evidence. Objection to that extremely speculative conclusion. First stain, but I do find the speculation Fascinating. So, Your Honor, we've shown that death was inflicted by the Winchester bullet fired from the police special. Deputy Terry has also demonstrated, through Cardiff's fingerprints, that he had been in possession of the weapon. In conjunction with the rest of the testimony, the people asked that Pete Cardiff be held for trial in the murder of Morton Rome. Granting the uh, ingenuity of some of the forensic testimony, the logic is flawed. I would counter by stating that the first bullet was the Peters. Fired into the victim while he was dressing, and thus shirtless. The murderer finished dressing his victim, and then fired the Winchester bullet into him. If this is true, then the state has yet to find the murder weapon. As for the police special they do have, Mr. Carter concedes that the gun had been in his possession earlier. But the very fact that the prints of others obliterated his upon the body of the weapon proves that the gun was subsequently in the possession of others. Now, the people have offered no proof that Mr. Cardiff was in the vicinity of the crime, unless his presence in Madison is considered vicinity. In which case, there are 50,000 souls crowding up the vicinity. But most importantly, there was no motive of it. Why? For what reason would he kill his companion and escape? Your Honor, my case in brief is that no case has been offered to bind this man over on this murder charge. Sorry, but if you could have held Carter, if I could have stalled signing my report. 
Well, you did a grand job, lad. Where's the judge who got you in? Mr. Paul, now that you've seen the teeth of our attorney, do you think you might be wanting to release that money? Not much, no. Wouldn't you like to tell me how your car ran off the road? Oh, did you hear that now? He's thinking that I wouldn't delight to tell the story, if I could remember it. He's intimating, Janie girl, that you'd take $500,000 for Brian. That's a question, ain't it? No, Paul, the question is whether you sign your report within 24 hours. Or I institute suit against you and the insurance company for the money, interest, and character assassination. Shall we go? Better like next time, Justin. Mr. Carr, a couple of pictures, please. I'm going to bring that girl down yet. For that phony lawyer, so help me. Easy, Paul. Don't you turn this into a personal vendetta. The hell you say. Bad break in there, Doc. All the good in the papers, I'm afraid. Thanks, Otto. Now what are your plans for Carter? Charlie and me are going to run him straight down to L.A. He's their problem now. You're going to stand here all day? Take me for your leader. Sorry, Doug. You did fine, Bob. And I still owe you that dinner in L.A. Forget it. Right now, I don't have much of an appetite. Yeah, I know what you're ah! I don't know. The, the, the chair just seemed to twist away. Didn't you feel it, Janie? It must have caused it. Yeah, yeah, right on my foot. Somebody is going to get sued. Otto, get him out of here. Come on, you can cry tomorrow. All right, all right. Out of the way. Well, it seems to be no harm done. If you'll excuse me, I'll say goodbye. Let me uh, help you to your car. No, thanks. It's with the garage fixing that carburetor. We'll take a cab. Cardiff's getting away with murder. All we can do is stand here and wave goodbye. <laughs> Come on, Brodsky, open it. Ooh, look at you. We got now. Where's that picture you took? Oh, sorry, Chief. That picture is going to be on the front page of the Madison City Times in exactly one hour, along with a story of how Chief Larkin was overpowered by his prisoner, then left handcuffed to another officer while Cardiff escaped in the police chief's car. Get her out of here! Oh, I'll go quietly, Chief. See you later, Doug. <laughs> How did it happen? He had a gun. Cardiff. We weren't 15 minutes out of town when he's ramming a gun in my side. Made us drive out in the desert and dumped us. Took our car, keys, guns, everything. And Otto misplaced the master key. Otto, how did he get the gun? I bet that shyster lawyer slipped it to him. Carr wouldn't get in that deep for anyone. It must have been someone else. The trial. Or that accident with a wheelchair. You know, during that pileup, anyone could have shoved a gun into Carter's pocket. Ow! Watch that pick. Carter's loose with an arsenal. We've got to find it fast. Already called for roadblocks. It's happened. She wouldn't let me close.
yourself without seeing you. I'll close up. Good night, Anita. Don't you keep him too long. He has a life to live, too, you know. What happened? Something to Mr. Frank. I told you it would. What? It all started when they got back from the trial. She and Mr. Frank, they were down in his room fighting. Did you go downstairs? I started to, but she... Mrs. Antrim? She was coming up. She told me to mind my own business. Then she wanted to go out, but her car hadn't come back. So she sent me into town to shop for the groceries in my car. She just wanted to get me out of the house. It was dark and real quiet when I got back. So? There was nobody home. Well, what about Mrs. Kane? Well, they dropped her off in town earlier. But it's Mr. Frank's room I wanted to tell you about. It was all torn up like there'd been a big fight. And to one side of his room, on the floor. What? Blood. What's happened to Jane? Well, I didn't know anything had. Well, she's not here. No, the, uh, the taxi brought me home just 15 minutes ago. Nobody's here. Have you looked down in Frank's room? Well, I called down. Let's have a look. Janie, are you all right? Why shouldn't I be? Where have you been? When the mechanic returned my car, I just went out for a drive. Why? Where's Frank? In his room, I guess. No, he doesn't answer. Oh, well, he must be sleeping. Well, I put the car away. Robert, I don't know how I missed it before, but this looks like a dried blood stain. Someone must have fought a war in here. Well, if you find out anything about where Frank's gone, sing out. With Chief Lock and Dotto in the garage, it's a sure bet Cardiff had something to do with it. Then where is Cardiff? Mr. Selby, the sheriff wants you down at the edge of the cliff. How many times do I have to tell you my car's been found? You can stop looking for it. What? He said, get some ropes down on a stretcher before the tide comes in. Rex? Is that Frank's body? No, it's... The private detective just fallen! <laughs> Can't tell very much. Multiple contusions from the fall, head bruises. Could be anything. Get on the autopsy right away, will you, Harry? Sure thing. Doug. Maybe Poland came to make Frank remember. They fought here. Frank was strong enough to cause a fuss. They both won over. No, I can't buy that. Read the ground. You're the elk hunter. You read it. There's no grooves. Should be if the wheelchair was involved. 
There was some kind of a fight here, but not with a man in a wheelchair. No, it was two men, toe to toe. And with Otto's car in the garage, I'd say one of them was part of it. Wheelchair? How did it get down there? Maybe Frank wheeled himself out and he started... He couldn't have. Frank can only get out of his room by riding that lift up. I found that lift at the bottom of the staircase, and by the looks of his room, he fought down there and lost. Fought who? Either Cardiff or Poland. The body was dragged here in a wheelchair, dropped over the side. The chair landed on a rock, Frank in the water, and he was washed out by the tide. It appears. Now, physically, I don't think Poland could have done it. But there was a fight here. How do you figure that? Try this. Poland saw Cardiff dragging Frank. He jumped him and was killed for trying. Why? Why kill Frank? All right, say Poland stumbled onto something. Had to be taken out in the spur of the moment. But Frank, that had to be premeditated. Why? I can give you a reason. His memory came back. Say it did. Who's threatened? His daughter-in-law. And she stands to inherit the half million. No. Jane Antrim couldn't kill two men by herself and throw them over the cliff. No, but a strong young thug for an accomplice could have. There's a link with Cardiff going back to the death of her husband. Rex, we could stand here all day and try to figure out who did what and why. And... Come on, let's try to find something concrete. Worksheet I found on the seat should be useful in eliminating the mechanics prints. I've been expecting you. A lawyer's work is never done. Mrs. Antrim phoned. Naturally, she's very upset. I have a doctor coming. He wanted to go to bed at once. Sedated. You are sure she wouldn't want to help us find out what happened to her father-in-law first. I assure you, if she had any information, she'd give it to you. She's inside waiting for you. God! Look at this guck. Oil tar splattered over the bottom of the car, and it's fresh. She must have driven it over a newly repaired road. The county doesn't use oil tar on its roads. It was a private road. Bob, let me see the mechanic's invoice. What are you looking for? The mileage. When the car left the garage, it read 9,147 miles. And the odometer on her car now reads 9,190. Now, that's a 43-mile difference. Three miles lost bringing the car from the garage to the Antrim home, leaving a round trip of 40 miles. 20 up and 20 back. This represents a 20-mile circle around the Antrim home. The mechanic swears there was no oil tar under her car when he worked on it. So, somewhere on this line, there's a freshly repaired private road. We've got to find it, Rex. Morning, Harry. Yeah, that fall that Poland took makes it almost impossible to determine the exact cause of death. Harry! Bob analyzed the dried blood stains we found downstairs. He says it was type V. What was Poland's blood type? I see. Thanks. Type O. Then Poland wasn't killed in Frank's room. Now, what's your move, Doug? I'm driving down to Los Angeles. Now, you look out. You know, someone down there might have sent Carter. He could be the arrow to someone's bow. Poland was digging in only one hole. The death of Brian Antrim. Murder must have come out of that search. Why? <laughs>
suppose I won't resist a court order, Mr. Selby, but it's Here's the copy of Mr. Antrim's medical record, Doctor. Thank you, Sarge. By the way, Dr. Garnett, is there any reason you didn't tell me that you'd known Brian Antrim? Oh, I didn't think that was important. I, uh, I had done minor surgery on him years ago, early in my career. I, uh, I'd forgotten it, that's all. It's quite a coincidence. His accident so near your hospital. It had to happen near some place, didn't it? Life plays funny tricks. So does death. Like your ambulance driver and his attendant turning up in Madison. I'm sure you'll find it has no connection with the sanctuary. Certainly we'll find the truth. You know... You know, the last time I was here, someone tried to force me off the road. That's terrible. It must have been an accident. Another accident. If anyone notified a potential killer of my activities, that person would be charged as an accessory. Did you know that? Well, of course. I would assume that anyone did. It helps like... to be aware of those little things. Goodbye, Doctor. Now, Rona, you, you're beautiful, darling, and you have no idea how good that's going to look in a tight close-up. Now, please, Rona. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. Do sit, Mr. Uh, soldier. It's exhausting looking up at you. Selby, the sanctuary, remember? Look, sweetie Pooh, close the door on that. Did you ever know a Morton Rome or a Pete Cardiff at the sanctuary? Look, Miss Corbin, it's a murderer on that. Won't you help? In a word, no. Bye. What are you doing? Don't do that. Please don't. 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 How did you know? I never heard a court pop. All that champagne and you're clear-headed. A case of ginger ale just went in your dressing room and an empty one came out. I tasted some champagne once. Yuck. Why all this camouflage to cover up the real reason you go to the sanctuary? It's hard to see the scars left by plastic surgery. It's some joke, huh? Rona Corbin, sex symbol, put together by a plastic surgeon. It's not a major crime. Look, I'm not a kid anymore. That is a major crime these days. You gotta be young or you insult people by not dropping dead. Especially in this business, and there's no middle years. You're young or you're old, period. You'd rather have people think you're a drunk. Listen, there's some fun in a good-natured tippler. But a sex symbol who has her face lifted every year is a bad joke. All this is my thing, and I love it, Selby. So don't blow it for me, please. I want to know about Brian Antrim. Oh, look, I was a kid. We got into some trouble, and he dumped me. When I became a starlet, he showed again. When it looked like my career wasn't going anywhere, out he ran again. Then bang, when I made a big hocus pocus, Brian. But I'd smartened up, I told him to pack it. That's the last I saw him, so help. You've got a real thing about him, don't you? Brian? He's one of the world's great people uses a taker, anything from anybody, a no good. That's, that's not the picture I get from the family. Oh, come on, they had to be used more than anyone to know Brian was to want to kill him. Miss Corbin. How was Brian connected to Dr. Garnett? Years back when Garnett was trying to raise money to open the sanctuary, I think Brian brought him some gamblers looking for a straight investment. You never saw Frank Antrim at the sanctuary? Not really. Uh, oh, I mean, twice. Uh, they'd wheel him down the hall and into his room after his operations. Could the operations have been back here someplace where it might affect his memory? It could be. He was all bandaged up. There was one wild thing about him. His night visitor. His what? His night visitor. Every night, someone came into his room. I could hear 
pacing like an animal in a cage. And then thumps. Crazy sounds. Heavy breathing afterwards. It was a weird scene. But during the day, nothing. Quiet as a grave. Don't worry about your thing. It's a secret. Keep a warm spot in here for our Rona, won't you, soldier? That's so you don't go away with the notion that Rona's only a figment of Dr. Garnett's imagination. His night visitor. It was a weird scene. Yes. Yes. Figment of Dr. Garnett's imagination. So that's the way it is. Talisman, the moon. It brought you your highwaymen, didn't it? Then look for me by moonlight. Watch for me by moonlight. Come to me by moonlight. Though hell should bar the way. He wants you know. Why do you say that? Because you're probably going to jail for a No, while. Doug, don't, don't. Say a thing like that. And I must warn you not to say anything to me without your lawyer present. Do you understand that? Yes. But why are you here? Because I want you to know that you won't be able to hide behind what you think I feel. Then you do feel something. As I do. Something. But not as much as you wanted me to. Three men have been murdered here, and you helped. Not true. Morton Rome died first, downstairs. There was a fight over Rome's gun. It fired. But there was no way to get rid of the body. Your mother's taxi blocked your car in the garage. So Rome was carried on the patio, and a second bullet was fired from a different gun to muddle the evidence. It's lies. Lies. Why would Rome come here? For money so he wouldn't tell about the death of Brian Antrim. I don't want to hear. But you know that's why Rome and Cardiff came to see you. No, it's not true. None of it's true. When you find Cardiff, he'll tell you. Cardiff drove the ambulance that night. He was too young for the part. That's why Rome had to play it. I didn't want to. I couldn't help myself. He was too strong for me. Help me. Please, Doug. Help me. I can't. There's too much blood. That card road is smack in the circle you drew on the map. You must have rented one of these houseboats. Which one? Let's wake up the manager. Mr. 
still that 9 millimeter pistol we're looking for. What do you want? Shh, shh, shh. You rented a houseboat in the last day or so. Louder, speak up, will you? What boats have you rented in the last two days? What's that? Who are you? Which houseboat did you rent? Doug, you're keeping me from doing my job. That man has killed three times already. Rome, Poland, and Cardiff. Cardiff? I... Clips rush them to the office so they make the morning edition. I'm on my way. Good. Tom, check all your men and keep them posted around the house until we take them out. Rex, I'm gonna get down there with Bob and keep an eye on things. But don't get so close they can't talk privately. Letting them talk to their lawyer in their own house. I don't know why you're so good to them. They should be in lockup right now. They'll be in lockup soon enough. A little humanity mixed with due process doesn't cost a cent. Mr. Selby, somehow I feel responsible. I, I don't understand. Please, tell me, how did it all happen? Why? Well, I don't know why. But I can tell you how it happened. Brian owed money, money he didn't have, to the syndicate. To save his life, he decided to die with Dr. Garnett's help. That would cancel the debt and bring, through Jane, a half million dollars. He hired two other accomplices, Morton Rome and Pete Cardiff. First, Brian had to build a new role for himself. His father had died in Europe, but nobody knew that. So Rome, posing as Frank, Brian's father, took time off from the sanctuary and came here for a visit. The night of the accident, your daughter, her husband Brian, with Rome posing as Frank, Brian's father, went out and put on their drunk act in front of the restaurant. Then Rome and Brian drove to meet Cardiff, waiting with the ambulance at a dangerous curve in a canyon road. Dr. Garnett had taken a dying derelict into the sanctuary. His body was in the ambulance. 
They transferred the derelict's body into Brian's car. Then, setting fire to it, they made sure it would be totally burned before pushing it over. Then Rome reverted to an ambulance attendant, and he and Cardiff drove back to the sanctuary, bringing Brian on a stretcher, leaving the derelict's corpse to be identified as Brian. An actress friend gave me the idea for what followed. Dr. Garnett, the plastic surgeon, altered Brian's face, simply aging him for his role as Frank. They made up a false dental chart to conform with the derelict's teeth. Cardiff had broken into the office of Brian's dentist and switched charts. Between the widow's lies and the fake dental charts, Brian is established as dead. Frank is alive with traumatic amnesia and confined to a wheelchair, helping to attest to the authenticity of the accident. Up to then, they'd made no mistakes aside from Brian's noisy exercises in his hospital room every night. They bankrupted themselves paying off their accomplices, only to find their own payday held up. Stahl, Jane, and Brian rented this house and retained A.B. Carr to force payment. On their own, Rome and Cardiff got into trouble. Escaping from the police, they needed cash to get away. They decided to blackmail the Andrews. Brian killed Rome and dumped his body into the pool. Then everything fell apart. Cardiff hid out in their attorney's house for safety, using the phone to blackmail the Antrims into a promise of money and the services of Carr when needed. Dr. Garnett called to tell him I was snooping down at that end. So Brian stole a car and tried to stop me by causing another accident. We caught Cardiff, and Brian had to help him escape. He released the handbrake in his wheelchair and ran into the police so he could slip the prisoner a gun. Then Cardiff escaped in the police chief's car and came here for his payoff. He walked into a trap and Brian killed again. This time, he carried the body to the edge of the cliff, but Poland stumbled onto him. He attacked Brian to stop him from throwing Cardiff into the sea. He died trying. Panic set in, and once again, Brian decided to die. He threw the wheelchair down to the rocks beside Poland's body. He wanted us to believe that Cardiff had killed both men and disappeared. We'd forever be looking for Cardiff that way. Then Jane drove Brian to the houseboats. He was to stay there until your daughter collected her half million dollars, and then they would both go abroad. I used to take those stairs back there three at a time when there was nobody around to watch me. Thank you for freeing my legs. But. You have bound my wrists with the rest of me to follow, eh? Well, man can't win them all, can he? Oh, Janie, if, if only I hadn't tried to see you. If only I hadn't come that night. I'll drink to that if your damn taxi hadn't blocked my way out of the garage. We'd be dancing in the clouds on a Paris flight right now. Don't talk to her like that. Oh, let's not have a falling out at this stage. Love. And don't use the word love to me. Oh, I did love you. And because of that, I did things that I can't bear thinking about. But love isn't a thing that you feel. It's a tool you use to get money. A weapon with which to kill people. It's been a long time since I felt anything for him. Anything but fear. I went on because I didn't know how to stop. And he was too strong. Please don't believe me. It doesn't matter. Don't say anything more. Anything I say you will use against me. You are, after all, the king's man. Someone has to be. I'm not looking forward to going into a courtroom on this one. Would you consider a deal on a plea? Let's leave that to the court, shall we, Counselor? Besides, there are some things about your part in all this we want to talk about. Talk? Certainly, any time. 
I know you're much too wise to say things you couldn't prove. Well, as the saying goes, see you in court. Now, how about lunch tomorrow with real china and silver that doesn't bend? You know, at what? Jane Antrim was wrong. You're not the king's man. I've decided you're mine. Oh, and what makes you so sure that you are? Be careful. Want... I must warn you that anything you say. I know will be used against me. Mm -hmm. 